Hi ladies and gentlemen, this is Ms. Skoken. We're here to talk about functions and their inverses. We're going to start with a warm-up and I'd like you to solve each one of these for x in terms of y. Turn the video back on when you're ready to check your answers. Okay, so hopefully you remember just a couple of key things. Number one, the plus or minus when we take the square root of both sides, and number two. And then in number three, hopefully you remembered your logarithm rules and you were able to convert it into exponential form or raise both of the sides as a power of e. If you have a question about any of these in your notes, please make sure to take a Make a post-it of it and stick it in your notes so that we can discuss it in class. For new objectives, determine whether the inverse of a function is also a function and write rules for the inverses of functions. Our new vocabulary is one-to-one -one function. And that's just what it sounds like. One X has exactly one Y and every Y has exactly one X. Now, we learned previously that an inverse function undoes the operations in the original function. The other thing that we learned about inverses is that the graph of the inverse is a reflection across the line y equals x of the original function. And then the last of all, the inverse of a relation or a function may be a function and might not be a function. To help us determine if a relation is a function we use the vertical line test and if our pencil well, if we use our pencil for the vertical line if the curve touches a pencil in more than one place for any given x then we know it's not a function it's just a relation well similarly we're going to use something called the horizontal line test to determine if the inverse of a function is actually a function so we're going to use the horizontal line test yeah. on the function that we're trying to determine if the inverse is also a function. Here's an example, and if you notice the dotted horizontal lines, that is representing the horizontal line test. So what we do, if we're trying to determine if a relation is a function, we just use a vertical line test. And in the case of the left-hand graph, it passes the vertical line test. We turn it sideways, we turn our pencil sideways and we use the horizontal line test and this is to determine if it's a one-to-one -one function. So in this case, it does pass the horizontal line test so we know that the inverse of the function that we see is also going to be a function. In the example on the right hand side, we have a parabola. We use the vertical line test to determine that it is a function and then we use the horizontal line test to determine if the inverse is also going to be a function. And of course we see it fails the vertical, I'm sorry, the horizontal line test, so we know that it is going to not be a function, the inverse that is. Let's take a look at an example one. In example one we have two curves. We have A which is blue, a blue curve, and we have B which is red, a red curve. And we want to use the horizontal line test to determine whether the inverse of the blue relation is a function. So we're going to use a horizontal line test and scroll it all the way up through graph A, through the function, the, I shouldn't say the word function, through the relation A, and we determine that using the horizontal line test that it is in fact, the inverse of A is in fact a function. And then we're going to take a look at B. And we can see that B is a function, it passes the vertical line test, but when we use the horizontal line test, we see that it's going to fail the horizontal line test. So we know that the inverse is not going to be a function. Remember from section 2 of chapter 7 that in order to find the inverse of a function, the way that we set it up is we switch the x's and the y's. Well, first of all, we replace f of x with y. Then we switch the x's and the y's and then we solve for y. And what we notice is that because the values of x and y are switched, the domain of the original function will be the range of its inverse and vice versa. So what we're going to try to do in example number two is write the rule for the inverse of this function. 
And what this means is we need to solve for x. So of course we're going to start out by putting it in a y and then we will solve for x. You can see here we replaced f of x with y and then the next thing that's going to happen is we're going to switch the x's and y's and then we're going to try to simplify. So what we notice is we're having a cube root on the right hand side. So if we cube both sides, then we'll get rid of the radical and we'll end up with x cubed is equal to y plus one. And y is equal to x cubed plus one. Okay, so because the inverse is a function, we're able to use function notation f inverse of x is equal to x cubed minus one and the domain of the range, the, I'm sorry, the domain of the inverse is the same as the range of the original function. And the range of the domain is all real numbers. So we have all real numbers for the domain and all real numbers for the range. And that is for this inverse cubic function. We've put it into the graphing calculator and you can see the graph with the symmetry over that line y equals x. So, you know, we have two different ways of, of seeing that it's an inverse. So we know that relations are not necessarily functions and we know that the inverses of functions are not necessarily functions. We do have a situation when a relation is a function and its inverse is a function and that's called a one-to-one -one function. That means that each y value is paired with exactly one x value. And sometimes we want to know whether functions are inverses, I'm sorry, whether, yes, whether funct uh, functions or relations are inverses of one another. And so what we do is we use composition of functions to determine that. So we insert one function into the other. And if we end up after simplifying with the result of x, then what we do is reverse the order and insert the other function this into the first one. And if we, again, after simplifying, end up with a value of x, then we know that those two functions were inverses of each other. So what we're going to do, here's the box showing the rule. And I know sometimes when we hear what it sounds like, it sounds a little bit more complicated, but when you see an example, you're gonna think it's very simple. What we're going to do, once again, is use composition of functions. If we're trying to determine if f of g and uh, if g of x and f of x are inverses of one another, then we're going to input g of x into f, and we're going to also input f of x into g. In both cases, we must get just x, and then we'll know that those are inverse functions. Let's take a look at example three, and example three is going to be an illustration of this. We have two functions, f of x and g of x, and we're going to start by finding the composition f of g of x. That means that it's going to be three times, instead of x, we're gonna input g of x, and then minus one. And th from here, we're just gonna simplify it we end up with x plus two. So f of g of x is x plus two. It's not equal to x. So we know that they're not gonna be inverses of one another. So we know because it wasn't equal to x, f and g are not inverses. We don't really need to go any farther. But if you wanted the practice doing composition of functions, of course, you're more than welcome to. But we really don't need to go any farther because it has to both be f of g of x and g of f of x equaling x. When we graph them, we can also see that they are not symmetric about the line y equals x. So again, another way that we can see that they're not inverses. Now we've got two other functions, f of x and g of x, and we're going to, again, use composition of functions to determine whether or not these are inverses of each other. So first things first, we're gonna insert g of x into f, and you can see how we've done that, and then we just simplify. We, we do have a little bit of fraction work like we had in the rational functions chapter, but we ended up with x. And so next, of course, is inserting f of x into g. And once again, after simplifying, we end up with x. 
This, by the way, is a good one to practice if you need some help use, or some practice using composition. You can see, since we ended up with x in both cases, f of g of x is equal to x and g of f of x is equal to x, we are able to claim that both of these functions are inverses of one another. The only additional thing that we need to do is say where we restrict our domain, and if we look back at the original functions, we know x cannot be equal to 1 because it would make f of x have division by 0 and x cannot be equal to 0 because that would make g of x be equal to 0. So that's it for restricting our domain. When we graph them on the graphing calculator we see that they are symmetric about the line y equals x.